So the next thing we have for you, we have the Great American Bash, and that took place on June 16th of 1996. To open up the show, we did get a video package, and the video package had Bobby Heenan saying he and his team are ready, and he is not worried about Savage, but you can tell he is. The video package then moves on to Savage telling the four horsemen to watch out tonight. We also open up with the national anthem because, of course, this is the Great American Batch. So we have to do that. We don't do it for any other pay-per-view, but we do it here. But we'll go to the first match of the night. It is Fire and Ice versus the Steiner Brothers. And the stipulation for this is that there must be a winner. But for the match, of course, like they have before, you got a lot of hog mollies in there. So we're going to hit each other with some stuff. Norton looks good giving offense. He doesn't look good taking it. No, He's not the best seller. Yeah, no, especially once we get to the ending of this match. Because at one point, Norton hits a devastating looking shoulder breaker. Uh, and I forget which Steiner it was, but it looked really good. There is a spot where Rick Steiner hits the Steiner line on Norton. I really like. And then as he picks up Norton's, uh, he German suplex Norton. And Norton kind of sells it. Remember how Seth Rollins would sell the German from Brock? He kind of does yeah. the same thing where he kind of like leans to that one shoulder. So I thought that was interesting that to see someone else sell pretty similar. The final sequence of this match was kind of a bit botched. Rick Steiner. Oh, it was. Yeah. Scott Steiner goes for the Frankensteiner, and uh, like you said, Scott Norton isn't the best taker of moves, so he does not take it well, and it looks really bad. And yeah, it's honestly one of the worst Frankensteiners I've ever seen, and Norton just does not roll with Scott Steiner well at all, and it's, yeah, yeah it's not, well, and, it does not look good. And then good. at the same time, Rick and Ice Train are crashing together, and then Ice Train, for some reason, tries to pin Rick Steiner, even though, like, his head is underneath the rope and all that, and it's just so weird. It was just a weird ending uh, for me. So, I, this match, I wouldn't rate any good. No, I like the other match they had on Nitro better the other week. So, yeah, not great, and, yeah, that's really all you can say for it. You do get some stiff shots and some nice-looking power moves, but, yeah, so you get to see some of that, but, yeah, it's not the prettiest thing. So this one, I usually like these kind of matches, but this one I probably would give a thumbs down. Yeah. But after that, we did have a backstage interview with the Taskmaster and Jimmy Hart. And Jimmy Hart says, tonight is the night that they don't need the horsemen. And then the Taskmaster says, this is not between the Dungeon of Doom and the horsemen. It's between him, Arn Anderson, and Ric Flair. Yes, and I think, yeah, that's about it for their promo. Did I miss anything on that? Nah, nah, we really need to get into Conan versus El Gato. Yeah, the next match we have is El Gato versus Conan for the U.S. Heavyweight Championship. And again, El Gato is Pat Tanaka, you said? Yes, Pat Tanaka. I didn't know that, but I just said I was very disappointed in the appearance of El Gato. He was only 33 at the time, I think, uh, when I looked it up. 33? Wow. It's just like, no one's heard this character, and I believe they just threw this character together just for a pair of match. He only wrestled as El Gato once, and that was a great American Bash in 96. So again, we're not going to tell you much about the match. It really doesn't matter, and it's not a great match to begin with. But Conan wins with an Alabama slam into a bridge. That's a nice Alabama slam Can into come a bridge. Up? I'll give him that. Uh, so yeah, just two disappointing matches in a row, but this one definitely is worse than the first match. I just don't get why they needed to dress Pat Tanaka up. They had a big roster at this point. Why not use anybody else? Just throw Brad Armstrong in there. Let's like see what somebody, happens. Yeah, like I don't know if they wanted to put the mask on him just so he resembles Tiger Mask or something. Because it, it looks like a knockoff Tiger Mask, a black Tiger Mask. It's really confounding. Whatever they were going for, they missed the mark. Yeah. But after that, we do have a backstage interview with Sting, where Sting makes fun of Regal for his tea drinking. I think, I believe he calls him like the sissies, yeah, and that's so it. And, yeah, they drink a little prissy. Yeah. You also drink tea like this, don't you? That little pinky out like that. Is that the way they breed the boys over there in England? Basically, uh, Sting that England. he's soft and stuff. Yep. And Sting tells Regal that uh, he's a little iffy, and he will straighten them out. Uh, interpret that line how you will. Yeah. He was definitely applying that. He was a little sweet. That is his interview. I don't think it was a bad interview. Well, and at the end, like, it I, is I think Gene, is. like, agrees with him. And then at the end of the promo, he, uh, Gene, like, apologizes. He said he should, probably shouldn't have said that or something like that. So I thought that was interesting that uh, it looks like Mean Gene even thought at the end. He's like, oh, man, I thought I went too far. Well, that's rich coming from Mean Gene. We slam wrestlers in front of them with Loch Ness and other people. <laughs> but the next match is Diamond Dallas Page versus Marcus Bagwell. And it is a match for the Lord of the Ring. So, that stupid ring DDP is carrying around. Originally, this was apparently supposed to be Diamond Dallas Page to great Muda, but they didn't want the Muda to lose to Paige, so that's, they didn't send him over. But this whole Lord of the Ring thing, I couldn't care less about. I'm not digging it. Again, this is another match that would be more interesting just a year down the line. Mm-hmm. 
I do love DDP always sells very comedically and kind of over exaggerated, but he does it well enough to make it always makes his opponent look good. So he did a good job with that. I, I always like the spots in DDP matches where he has the abdominal stretch, let's just say, and he'll reach back for the rope, and then the ref will look that rope, that rope's moving. DDP's like, nah, bro, does, I ain't uh, touched that. Same thing with the the side lock rest hold or whatever he does. Yeah, I, I just like that in the match. He's just like, no, I didn't do it. <laughs> like yeah, basically, the ending of those matches, he blocks a fisherman suplex and then hits the diamond cutter. Yep, diamond cutter, and that move is over with the crowd now, but it's about to start getting really over yeah. with them. But yeah, it's a decent match. Nothing uh, real no, because there was no real story to this match. Yeah. There was just two random people thrown <laughs> now, together. Remember, originally, Down and Dallas Page was supposed to get the title shot against the Giant, but they WCW thought that you know DDP wasn't a big enough name, so they gave it to Luger instead. I understand why they did that, but why not just have Luger win the Lord of the Rings then? Okay. I don't understand. Or just have the title match be on Nitro, and then just have Luger, get, right. like we said, get Luger a different avenue to the title shot. There you go, Darcy Debbie. And who's that benefactor anyway? <laughs> <laughs> You'll never know. But let's move on. After this, we got a backstage interview with the Giant. The Giant says the only torture is going to be with Lex Luger. He tells Luger he is mistaken if he thinks he can get the torture rack on him. And he tells Luger the choke slam is all he is going to know. So no more rhyming. That looks like it is out the window. So hopefully he never does it again. <laughs> but our next match is Rey Mysterio Jr. versus Dean Malenko. And this is for the Cruiserweight Championship. This yeah. is Rey Mysterio's first WCW pay-per-view appearance. The WCW debut of probably the greatest luchador of all time, at least in our era. I mean, I would say he's definitely, definitely there. I can think of anyone better. But through this match, Malenko at this time, a lot of his matches kind of start similar. Malenko will dominate the early portions and then he'll transition from submission move to submission move, working different body parts, or sometimes the same body part, but in different ways. So that's kind of... How this match goes. In so, fact, yeah, it goes on. Of, uh, hole trading and then reversals. Yeah. It goes on long enough to where you can hear some fans start saying boring during the match. But I didn't think it was that bad. But for there were a lot of holds. Rey Mysterio did not get much offense in until near the end of the match. He kind of wakens the crowd up with a jumping senton from the top rope to the outside. And then he has a springboard drop kick as well. So he's starting to get the crowd excited here. And he tries to go for a super Frankensteiner or Hurricane Rana, but Dean turns it into a power bomb. And then he, he pins Ray and he puts his feet in the row, so he's a little, getting a little heel. He's a little, he's a little cheater. Little... And, and the crowd really woke up for that finish. They enjoyed it. This match is quite long. It goes almost 18 minutes. And the crowd was probably away for the last few minutes. It started really kicking the high gear. I'm very sure Dean Malenko, you're always going to get good matches. Um, the crowd, yeah. you know, since this was Ray's debut, they didn't know what to make of him at first, but now, you know, they got a good idea after this match. Yeah, for sure. This is a good debut for Mysterio. This is definitely the best match of the night so far, even though it was a little bit long. But yeah, very good. Very good introduction to Ray Mysterio. But we'll move on. <laughs> next is an interview. Mean Gene interviews Lex Luger, who is a TV champion. And let me tell you, the TV title means nothing during his reign, unfortunately, because most of the time he doesn't even have it on. Uh, he does in this promo because he's a tag champ as well. I Let me tell you how many times he's defended this TV championship. He defended it four times. And he had a long title reign with that. Uh, they shouldn't have given the title to Luger at all if they weren't going to well, do it. Well, Luger's too high profile at this point to be a TV yeah, champion. Yeah, yeah. He shouldn't I, be a TV champion. Like, I just don't understand why he had the title belt, period. But Luger says he is here physically, but his mind is a million miles away, focused on the Giant. He says the Giant has changed the WCW forever with his size and his finishing maneuver. He said the Giant thinks he is in invincible, but Luger's going to use that against him he says when a man thinks he is invincible that's when he makes mistakes and he will capitalize on all of them there's one point in the promo where lex like slows down you can tell he's trying to remember his line luger is an interesting promo because when he doesn't mess up in the beginning he usually can get through it pretty good and he'll he won't have any issues but when he flubs coming out the gate it's like a car crash he just gets worse uh but no he was fine here i think but uh, yeah, that's that. So we'll go to the next match. And it is a Big Bubba with Jimmy Hart versus John Tenta. He's a man, not a shark. But of course, this is sort of kind of a uh, heated feud going on right now, even though it doesn't. the fans don't really particularly care about it too much. But you know, there's issues between these two men. So they, of course, they go right after each other to start. Tenta kind of gets the offense in first. But at one point, Bubba pulled something out of his pocket. I didn't quite get a good look at it. But he hits Tenta with it, which knocks him down. And then Bubba starts working Tenta's leg. Because, you know, when you got a big man, you got to work the legs, man. 
But Bubba at one point hits a nice looking back suplex on Tenta, but the finish sees Bubba going for a move off the top rope, but Tenta catches him and power slams Bubba for the win. And Tenta, he knows how to catch somebody. I believe he catches Bubba pretty clean. He's pretty clean, yeah. And he was a very strong dude. Unlike Scott Norton, he'll catch you. <laughs> but, uh, this, but, match was, this match wasn't great, but it was short. It was 5 minutes, 24 seconds. So at least they were in and out. I, they picked I, the right winner. Yeah. Tenta was, should have been the pick. Yeah, because Big Bubba winning would do nothing. I did like both of these wrestlers, but this feud isn't doing it for me. They, they feud forever, and no one cares. I think they had a, like a couple week span where Tenta was getting good reactions during this point in time, but they never capitalized on it. And I, and I believe it's solely because the look kind of yeah, killed him hair, off. Yeah. They completely botched it. Yeah. I'm not saying he would have been main event, but I thought they could have had something to where the fans would care about well, here's his the character. Thing, like I just don't know. Yeah, you could get fans behind it, but once like the NWO is here, it's like, I just like a person like Earthquake. I just don't know how they you would uh, keep them around. <laughs> but yeah, that's the match there. But we'll go on after this, of course, like the rest of the night. Seems like after every match, we get a backstage interview segment. But this time it is with Mongo McMichael and Kevin Green. Mongo tells Arn and Flair they're coming for them. And then Kevin Green says that tonight reminds him of a goal line. He's coming hard. He's coming heavy. <laughs> like, I like phrasing there, pal. Phrasing. And then Macho Man says he, the smell of winning is in the air. But the next match is a no DQ match between Chris Benoit versus the Taskmaster. Max and I are theorizing that Benoit is a replacement for Pillman. So it makes sense. It might not be true. That's just what we think. Uh, honestly, I think the Benoit Sullivan would have been better than the Pillman. But yeah, I agree. But this match here, uh, of course, like you're going to see in this feud, they like to go to the crowd, so guess where we're going? The match uh, no, we're goes going up. More than just the crowd. <laughs> yeah, so we go into the crowd and we work our way all the way into the men's bathroom. And then at one point, when they're in the men's bathroom, there's like a woman in there, and Dustin, he's like, "There's a lady in the men's room." <laughs> <laughs> when they're in the bathroom, Sullivan like gets Benoit into the bathroom stall and like slams the bathroom door on him like three times. These these boys are hitting each other with some they stuff. They're very yeah, they are laying it in at this point. One spot which I think is absolutely crazy is when they start working their way back from the bathroom, uh, which during this part of the match, Sullivan is just putting a beat down on Benoit. And when they come back to the arena, when they're on like the rent stairs coming down, oh, when he hits the barricades. Uh, Benoit down and Benoit like, runs. yeah, oh, he bumps down the stairs. Yeah, that, I, I was like, that is not a good idea. Yeah, Benoit literally is thrown down as concrete steps. It's unbelievable. I'm like, it's why would you ever say, painful. take the, I would ever take this? And I believe Benoit falls down multiple sets of stairs. Yeah, it, dude, it was a lot. It was bad. I don't know, maybe all that muscle will help absorb it, but it's just not a good idea. Oh, yeah, for sure. But eventually, they do make their way down to the ring again. And Benoit throws a table at Taskmaster. Eh, that like it kind of hurt a little bit. But eventually, Sullivan gets Benoit on the table. The, the, and the crowd's going nuts throughout most of this match. This is a really good match. I would definitely, this is definitely my recommended list. <laughs> to me, this is the best match, which is disappointing because this is pretty much starting it. Yeah. But, but, uh, but the finish sure. the finish is kind of unique. So what happens is Benoit puts the table on the top rope, so it's like kind of standing yeah, flat on the top it, he rope. He rests it on it because his goal is he wants to stand on it. And he does accomplish that because he gets himself and the Taskmaster on there, and he superplexes the Taskmaster off of the table for the win. It it's a, a unique spot. finish. What, the second Benoit lands that superplex, that crowd goes nuts. Up on top! Yeah. He's gonna try a superplex from the table! He got him too! Oh my god! He yeah, I would say this is a finish. I won't be mad if they recycled. Well, yeah, like Angle's kind of done something similar. Remember he did the uh, Angle suplex using the table for leverage? Mm hmm yeah, maybe maybe they were paying homage to this, uh, but yeah, I like that spot. Actually, I'm sure it's been done before, but I'm still. Sure, yeah, I, I'm sure other companies have done something similar. It's just the first time we've seen it. But yeah, no, I like the finish a lot, and like I said, this was a pretty good brawl. And those can sometimes be a little boring when you have, like the Chicago Street Fight for WCW. Yeah, that was this boring. This is much better than the Chicago Street Fight, in my opinion. Yes, yes, I agree. And, and it also helps how into it the crowd is. Because they, I think they can tell these guys are beating the living shit out of each other. 
and, and they appreciate it. But Benoit mm-hmm. puts the boots to Sullivan after the bell. Jimmy Hart runs out, and Arn Anderson comes out as well. Arn Anderson pulls Benoit off of Sullivan and like tells him to calm down. But then Arn turns around and starts to kick Sullivan, and the crowd goes nuts because that they know this means horseman time. So they're putting the boots to him, and then the I think the regular dungeon members come out and take, walk him out. Yeah, and I was happy when Arn Anderson kicked Taskmaster because they've been kind of buddying up the two factions. Yeah, so I was happy that that kind of was done, that the horseman would be back to being the horseman. So I liked it. They go backstage, and then they get interviewed by Mean Gene. Like, getting into promo, Ben yells, like, righteousness! And then, and then like, nothing. Because Ben was obviously a, a bad promo. He's he's honestly a terrible promo. But the real talker, yeah. Arn, gets on and says, the wannabes are out of here, again, referencing Pillman. And he's telling Benoit that, you know, like you said, there are people who are wannabes that thought they were horsemen. There's people who had dreamed to be a horseman and never wore a horseman. But Benoit today earned it. We're officially inducting Benoit as like this certified member of the horseman. Because uh, that's been a relatively new thing for him to be in this group. Yeah. Uh, Arn says they severed the head of the snake that has tried to poison the most elite fighting unit in sports. Arn then tells the Taskmaster that they are ready for a war, and he tells Sullivan he can bring whoever, because they are loaded for a bear. I guess they're talking about the giant there. Yeah. And then Benoit tells Sullivan that he has been served, and he put him in his place tonight. You've been served, Sullivan? And then, let's see, Flair turn, and he says, Mongo and Kevin Green, look at their team. Compared to yours, we're so much better than you. The Ric Flair does have a line, and it says, uh, because he talks about Macho Man too, he says, there's a lot of things Macho Man would like to do that he can't do anymore. Right, Liz? So that was that got me that got me a laugh. And, and then, then Heenan, of course, at the end, begs the Macho Man again not to hurt him. But next, we have a match that I was looking forward to. It is Steven Regal versus Sting. The crowd is very happy to see Sting. He gets a pretty good ovation today. Yeah, they were really into him doing this match. Of course, like usual, we get some pretty good character work from Regal and Sting. At one point, though, uh, Regal goes to shake Sting's hand, but Sting declines, and Regal gets upset. And that was unsportsmanlike from Sting, don't you think? It's like, what does he think Regal would do? Punch him as he's shaking his hand? Did you see Regal's smile? He was very genuine. But yeah, Sting, you're supposed to be a babyface here. But kind of like with the Malenko match, Regal works on different holds on Sting, which I don't mind that kind of wrestling. No, I'm not if, wrestling with Regal, so. Yeah, if you don't like it, then you're not going to like this, but I like it. Mm-hmm. I'll go on with the match. He puts on the Regal stretch, which I don't know if it's called the Regal stretch at this point, but I noted it because that's the first time I have noticed him doing that move. But Sting eventually gets the Scorpion Deathlock on Regal, who taps out pretty quickly. I wish he didn't tap out so quickly on that. Yeah. I think they even said something about the commentary they wanted to talk about because they didn't want Stain to put, do any damage. In real life, you probably would. Like in, in MMA, if someone's got that armbar and you're going to tap out pretty quickly because you're not going to want your, you know, your armbar. True. I, I just think, because you're trying to build him up, it seems, because why else would you put him in a match with Sting? So I don't like that. It's kind of like when we had the Mark Henry John Cena match, he tapped out pretty quickly to the STF, yeah, and I didn't like should. that. No, uh, but this match, I actually really like this match. Regal got in a lot of offense and he yeah. battered Sting throughout. They gave him a um, lot of time too. They gave him 16 and a half minutes. But yeah, check this one out. Pretty good stuff. Next, uh, but we got next, one of the marquee matchups. Yep, and Michael Buffer is out to announce the next two. He usually only comes out to the main event. They wanted so the to, fact, uh, they yeah. wanted to make sure that y'all thought this was a big deal. So the next match is Ric Flair and Arn Anderson with Woman and Miss Elizabeth and coached by Bobby Heenan versus Steve, Mongo, McMichael, and Kevin Green with their coach, the Macho Man. And maybe the most important thing for me here, Jacob, is Pepe makes his illustrious return. He's there to watch his papa in his wrestling debut. There's a point on commentary. It doesn't sound out of the ordinary until something happens later in the match, but Tony Schiavone makes a note that Mongo McMichael switched teams for money, uh, which honestly and I did not know that Mongo ever left the Bears. Uh, yeah, apparently he played for the Packers. He went to the enemy. Yeah, it's a little foreshadowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty good when you can sneak those in. But one thing the announcers do also mention that they say Macho Man has followed through with the WCW's demands and he will be reinstated tomorrow on Nitro. So I think his suspension or his whatever it lasted a few weeks. Yeah, and he was pretty much on TV every week anyway. I will say Mongo had a he had a lot of rough patches, but he was over. The crowd was into him at one point. Mongo's not as bad as everyone says he is. We've seen a lot worse. But 
when Mongo is bad, he is exceptionally bad, uh, and we will have plenty of clips of that. Yes, he is, and it's, it's usually in the beginning of a match too. He he's gets al- too excited. He's always too excited, and I think nervousness because he's like tense. <laughs> he looks very tense when he's wrestling. Yeah, he's not as bad as I say. Eventually, Mongo gets a tag into Kevin Green, and Kevin Green is excited to be in there. He is amped up. He should be in high voltage. He's amped up like those guys. Yeah, high on life and wire for sound. Um, but I thought for this match that Kevin Green wasn't that bad. And I, I don't think Mongo was really that bad either because I don't have notes on him messing it no. up. At some point, Benoit comes out and attacks Randy Savage to get him out of the way. Yes, but then at one point, uh, while the fellas are doing their thing in the ring, a woman and Miss Elizabeth confront Deborah, and eventually they all go to the back during the match. And then later, as the match is still going on, Deborah comes out in a nice dress. Looks like she wasn't wearing this nice dress before. Yeah, it looks kind of expensive. Deborah's also holding a briefcase, a Halliburton. A Halliburton, and, yeah. <laughs> and she hands it to Mongo. Mongo opens it and finds a lot of money and a Four Horsemen t-shirt. So I will say this spot took a while to set up. Because, like, I don't know if it takes too long to close the briefcase or what. But Kevin Green's reaching out for help from Mongo as he's holding the Halliburton. And... Uh, I think uh, McMichael knows what the deal is if he wants that money. He's wax green on the head with the Halliburton. And then and Flair that's... covers for the win. Now, this match was a bit long. It's, uh, it was over 20 minutes long. I do think it went on about f- at least five minutes too long. But I do think at the time, this would have been a good swerve for the crowd to have Mongo join the Horsemen. Yeah. And for them, it's probably a good, it was a good idea on their behalf to try it because they're investing some money into Mongo McMichael, who was a big name football player, too. They want to put him in the best position to succeed, so I understand why they did this. But Mongo has officially joined the Horsemen. Yeah. Post match, Savage comes back out and fights Flair. And then Mongo attacks Randy Savage. Yep, but this one the crowd really liked. The match wasn't bad. It was a little long, like you said. Could have shaved some time off, but a lot of that near the end, a lot of time was invested in uh, setting up the Mongo turn with the briefcase and the women leaving and all that sort of stuff. Mongo's the fourth horseman, so the horsemen got their two members, now they're four again. But next, we then have a ramp interview. Eric Bischoff is there, and he's interviewing Scott Hall and Kevin Nash. So they come out, and they don't come out to the NWO music. I don't know if they come out to any music. And the crowd is pretty excited to see them come out. You can tell, like, I think some of the male audience is like, dude, freaking yes. Yeah. But Bischoff tells them that he is going to give them an answer of who the members of Team WCW are going to be. He tells Scott Hall and Kevin Nash that they're on and the match will be at Bash at the Beach. Bischoff also asks Hall and Nash they work for WDF because of the lawsuit that WDF is filing. Well, I think also with the way the rest of this interview or segment took place, that this felt so out of place for him to directly shift into that. Yeah. Like, it was kind of like they were forced to do it. They were, they were forced to do it. But anyway, they answered, no, they're not employed by the WWF. Mm-hmm. And then Scott Hall tells them to worry about the future, not the past. And Bischoff then, of course, he, we're not going to find out who the three men are going to be tonight. Why would we? Bischoff says he would tell them on Nitro. So Hall grabs Bischoff by the suit jacket collar, and he tells him not to jerk them around. And Hall then punches Bischoff, and Kevin Nash then picks him up and jackknifes Bischoff off the stage. That's a pretty, like, it looked a pretty rough for a bump, and I'm not sure if Bischoff had ever taken a bump before that. Look at her. And then as they leave, Scott Hall grabs the mic, and he says the real big guys just left the building. And then we have a stretcher come out for Eric Bischoff. But I thought for the segment, I mean, to end it with the jackknife on Eric Bischoff, yeah, that's going to get people talking, I think, the next day. But next, after we take a while to get Bischoff out of here, we then go to our main event, which is Lex Luger versus the Giants with Jimmy Hart for the WCW Championship. And as Luger comes out, he checks on Bischoff on his way to the ring. He's looking, hey, you got to make sure the boss is okay. And there's no posing for Luger today because he's all about business. He's taking this match seriously. To start, Luger runs at the Giant, but Giant big boots him. You just can't come out the Giant like that, man. You gotta be a little smarter. But eventually, Luger does get a sleeper hold on the Giant. And while this is happening, Jimmy Hart goes to hit Luger with a megaphone. But Sting runs out and he grabs it from Jimmy Hart and chases Jimmy Hart out of the match. Luger does eventually get the giant down by going after his leg. The giant doesn't stay down long. He gets back up and he charges at Luger. Luger's in the corner of the ring and the giant misses and he gets himself stuck on the top rope, which kind of looked ridiculous. 
But it's just so that Luger can give him a few kicks to the ribs. They set up that spot to get Giant up there laying flat on the turnbuckle so that Luger has an easier time getting him in the torture rack. So Luger gives him a few kicks to the ribs, and then he motions for the torture rack, which gets the crowd excited. So he gets the Giant in the torture rack very briefly, and then he collapses. So the Giant then gets back up and hits Luger with a choke slam for the win. And this match was completely clean uh, because even the Jimmy Hart spot didn't really affect the match. So that was kind of anticlimactic to me. Yeah. Now this was not as good as that Sting Giant match. Yeah, Sting Giant was better. Uh, What were your thoughts on the pay per view as a whole? I liked the pay per view. The only really uh, slow parts really were John Tenta and Bubba. And uh, the main event. The first two matches. Yeah, and and, and, yeah, and the main event was kind of mad. But doing a lot of heavy lifting to me was the Sullivan Benoit match. That was really good. That was the match of the night by far. I liked Rey Mysterio versus Dean Malenko. That was good, but I still preferred Benoit Sullivan. Yeah, Stephen Regal's Sting, I think, was pretty decent. Yeah, I think I liked that one. Yeah, I, I think on the whole, I think this was a pretty good show. Like, I don't know, seven out of ten maybe. There, I wouldn't say there was a great match on here, but there are some pretty good matches. I but there's myself for rewatching it. Yeah, this is certainly not a uh, uncensored or slamboree. So this is definitely a much better pay per view than the last two have been. So we'll just go into the next night, Monday night, which is June seventeenth of nineteen ninety six. We have a recap of the Outsiders jackknifing Bischoff off the stage. They also announced that Bischoff would not be here tonight. He's actually going to uh, take yeah. a few weeks off to sell this. Which is good. It would have been a bad look if he just showed up. I agree. But the first match for Nitro is Stevie Ray versus Rick Steiner, which I think we had Booker T versus Scott Steiner the other week. So now we get the, the other guys in here. This, I would say, is not as good as the Booker T Scott Steiner match. I wouldn't say Stevie Ray is a bad wrestler. I don't think he's bad, but he's certainly not as good as Booker T. No, he's not as good as Booker T. I do think he's overhated on. Single Stevie Ray, you have some dreadful performances coming. Well, maybe that's where the hate comes from. I don't know. I'll have to see. For the match itself, of course, we get some good spots in here. Uh, Rick Steiner hits the overhead belly to belly. Then Stevie gets his turn at a power move. He has a power slam on Rick Steiner. And then he goes to the top rope, but he misses. And Rick Steiner hits the Steiner liner for the win. And then after the match, Brooker T comes out, and the two of them beat up Rick Steiner. They're setting up, I believe, a Harlem hangover. And Scott Steiner comes out and he covers his brother. And then Booker T does a move on him. And then the both of them are down. They both get taken out. And Harlem Heat stomp on them and leave. So they get the boots put to them. The match isn't great, but the the crowd was into it. Um, so yeah, not bad. And again, they're kind of build up Steiner Brothers versus Harlem Heat feud, which I'm all for. The next match we have is Disco Inferno versus Joe Gomez. But of course, Disco, as he's wanting to do, he gets on the mic before the match and he says he knows that every fan here today paid to see Disco Inferno dance and he asked the crowd if they want to see him dance and says if they want it, they got it. So he starts dancing and then he's interrupted by Joe Gomez and what is his Nitro debut. During this match, Shivani says that there was a phone call from Hulk Hogan saying if they want a war, he wants to be a part of it. I like the way they phrased it because we know what's going to happen eventually. But Hogan's not lying here. He's not saying he's going to be on Team WCW. That's just the impression because he's been a WCW guy. It's just a little hint saying that, hey, by the way, Hogan might be involved here. But yeah. And I have a note here that I, I, Joe Gomez to me looks like a smaller Mongo McMichael. Yeah, he kind of the same, a similar body type for sure. The finish sees Gomez reversing a pin attempt from Disco Inferno, so he gets a pin attempt and wins. I wasn't too impressed with Joe Gomez. No one to was. be, to, yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. I, he's just so bland to me. But after Disco Inferno lost, he looks at the camera and says he isn't upset because his hairstyle looks good. Oh, Disco. He at least got you entertained if nothing well like we said when wrestlers are into the character they can usually make some good moments even in gimmicks that aren't great and i think disco does a good job with this so when you're invested in the character i think it could work but after this we have a backstage interview with rick flair woman deborah and miss elizabeth and gene tells deborah that he is disappointed in her but deborah tells gene that she had to do it and says she did it for the money and great company Flair says the horsemen are united and it feels so good. 
He tells Gene that Kevin Green is in the hospital, and he mentions that Macho Man is reinstated and wants his money and Elizabeth back, but it's not going to happen. And tonight, Savage is going to get hurt and get hurt bad. All right, so let's go to the Raw side of things. But Raw starts off with Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Savio Vega, and this is the second round of the King of the Ring tournament. And Stone Cold still has the Ringmaster music, so we still have not moved on with that. I just like to keep notes of when we kind of transition. Yeah. But Stone Cold works Savio's leg for a while during this match. Savio Vega then later returns a favor and works Austin's leg. But during this match, Vince announces that Brian Pillman has signed with the WWF, and tonight we will watch some of his press conference. Yeah. I mean, I was like, wow, damn, is Pillman's here already? But Vega gets a false finish here near the end. He hits his spinning wheel kick on Austin, but Stone Cold gets his foot on the ropes. Uh, so Vega then goes to grab Stone Cold from behind, and Stone Cold then hits Vega with the Stone Cold Stunner. And that's the first time he hit the move on Raw, and he gets to win with it as well. So I think this is the first time we are officially using it as his finish. And this is also yet another Stone Cold versus Savio Vega match. At this point, on June 17th, how many times have they have wrestled that you have? This is the fourth meeting? That feels like more, man. But then after this match, we do get a Undertaker pre-recorded video, and he tells mankind he will pay for his sins, and he will take his tormented soul and put it in eternal darkness. And again, since Nitro is two hours, we'll just go back and do a couple more of their matches. So the next match for Nitro is Chris Benoit and Arn Anderson versus the American Meld. And with how these two tag teams are being built right now, I think you can tell who's going to win this match. But one thing I will note that after last night's brawl with Kevin Sullivan, Benoit has a nice shiner going on the side of his face. Yeah, he does. And when the American males come out, they come out to some booze. It definitely feels like this group is going to be splitting because it's not working. And we, you can tell it's just kind of done. And guess what? They do split up a few months later. And at one point, uh, I don't know if you took note of this, but a Benoit goes for a diving headbutt on Bagwell, actually, and he hits it, but he smacks himself pretty good on Bagwell. Yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's a rough diving headbutt. And, like, you can hear the smack. Soon after that, Benoit wins the match by suplexing Riggs on the ropes, and then he pins him. But, I mean, not much of a match. We kind of knew where it was going. No, it was it's just kind of... To, to, to show everybody the new horseman. But after the match, we have an in-ring interview with Benoit and Arn Anderson. Arn says that everybody in this building and all over the world are in shock. And he says when the horsemen say they're going to do something, they do it. Arn tells Sullivan they had a business deal, but business deals, they can go south. And when it does, there's a time where someone has to take a bath and the other gets rich. He tells him that there's only room for the four horsemen. So the Dungeon Doom's got to get out of here. Benoit then tells Sullivan that every reaction has an equal and opposite reaction. And Sullivan found out about that reaction last night. And he says the horsemen are about guts, glamour, and glory. So, yeah, that's that's that. Benoit, yeah, still not the best delivery. Yeah, it's the way not, it his, like, not his worst. Guts, glamour, and glory. It's like, it's really yeah, bad. it's just, he, he has no flow to his promos. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, then we have a John Tenta video before the next match, and he's telling Bubba he got some revenge last night, but tonight he will finish the yeah, job. If, if you didn't love the match enough like Great American Bash, you're going to get it again tonight. Yeah, baby, because next we got Big Bubba with Jimmy Hart versus John Tenta. And Tenta comes out again. He doesn't have any music again with the half head shaved and all that. So how long are they going to have this man walk around like this? I do not know. But this is, you know, really similar to the other match. It's just, it's just I, I don't know. It's just not clicking for me. I, I just want to go straight to the finish. Uh, Tenta kind of, he actually cheats to win this one, doesn't he? Yes, he does. So Jimmy Hart goes to hit Tenta in the back with the megaphone, and it doesn't really have an effect. Tenta then a topic drops Jimmy Hart out of the ring, which is always funny because Jimmy Hart kind of like flies out of the ring. Yeah. And then Tenta power slams Bubba and goes for the pin, but... He lifts Bubba up at the two count, and he hits another power slam for the win this time. But he uses the bottom ropes for the win. He didn't really need to. I think it was just to put some more stank on it. Yeah. After the match, Tenta then chases Jimmy Hart out of the ring, and Hart throws a sock full of quarters into the ring. And Bubba gets it, and he hits Tenta multiple times with it. But after this match, we do get an in-ring interview with Bubba and Jimmy Hart. Jimmy Hart says they are making examples on everyone who turns on the Dungeon of Doom. 
Bubba says, the quarters are nothing but chump change, but look at the damage it did to that fat beached whale in the ring. He says, every time he is in the ring, he kicks John Tenta's butt. I'm like, you're kind of incorrect, sir. John Tenta won yesterday and today, sir. I'm just going to... He loses every match I've seen in the feud. <laughs> so, uh, I got to say, uh, you're kind of wrong. I mean, I guess at the end, maybe, you did beat him up uh, today, but still. I mean, he didn't say he win. He just said he gets butt kicked, so technically he might be right. I guess. And then we have a backstage interview with Macho Man. Macho Man says he is going to take his time with Flair, and he will not go away. He says he is staying in the WCW forever, and there is no man that can put him down. And he again does the thing where he says he saw a woman psychiatrist who told him to told him he had OCD. One cool dude. And he says he is happy because of what he is going to do tonight. He does love that psychiatrist line. I'm pretty sure that's the third or fourth time we've heard that line. But that's that. And the next match for Raw is Mark Merrill with Sable versus Owen Hart. And this is another second round matchup for the King of the Ring tournament. And uh, Stone Cold is on commentary and he says Mark Merrill is built for show, but he is built for go. And Owen Hart is still wearing the cast while he wrestles. And throughout the match, Owen Hart complains to the ref about Merrill going after his injured arm. I think it was like after he got a hip toss or something or he couldn't do a hip toss. I can't remember what it was. But anyway, he yells at the crowd like, shut up, I got a hurt arm. Love it. But near the end, Owen Hart lands a fisherman suplex for a two count. Always love a good fisherman. Mm -hmm. uh, but Merrill wins with a pin reversal. Owen Hart complains to the referee and then attacks Mark Merrill after the match. And then Owen Hart hits Merrill with his cast and he tells the camera that Merrill is a bad man who tried to hurt his arm. Which I thought was funny. And then uh, Merrill is, you know, he's down and out. And then trainers come up to him and try to help him up. Did you catch the line Lawler said on commentary? He said that Golda should give Mero some artificial insemination. Wow. I, I don't uh, know if King meant to say that, but yeah, that was pretty interesting. Yeah, like, that was not a mistake. <laughs> no. But yeah, this match was pretty decent. But again, the Mark Mero character is not really, not really working out. But after the match, we do get an in-ring interview with the British Bulldog and Diana. Bulldog says that he is telling everyone that he has all the confidence in the world. And he says that Shawn Michaels tried to mess with his most beautiful possession, and which is his wife. And he will take Shawn's most prized possession, which is his title. And Jim Ross tells Bulldog, hey, that Shawn Michaels, he might be listening to this. So Bulldog responds, and this made me laugh. He says, I don't give a frog's butt ass. That Shawn is listening. I know, I don't think I've ever heard that. I was like, I've never heard anyone say that. And it's just funny coming from him with his accent, too. So uh, that got a choke out of me. Uh, but he tells Sean that if he had any guts, he would come out and face him. So I guess Sean does have some guts because he runs down to he the runs ring. Right and the... out there. Yeah, he was ready. He was that gorilla waiting. So both men go brawl with each other, and they eventually have to be separated by officials. But the two men still go after each other as we go to a commercial. Uh, these two men really not liking each other at this moment. That's yeah, a good segment. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, very effective because I was lukewarm on the feud, but this definitely made me a little bit more interested than I was going in. And, I've, and I'm starting to have a more of an appreciation for Bulldog as well. Um, and then I will go back to Nitro, and we will go to the fifth match of the night. And it is Macho Man versus Ric Flair with Woman and Miss Elizabeth and Deborah. He gets all the ladies to come out. When Flair comes out, he has a shirt that says Mean Green Sack Machine. Yeah, Sack Machine in the ring or something like that. Which is, of course, mocking Kevin Green. Ric Flair gets on the mic and he asks Kevin Green, where is he now? And then he tells Macho Man that every man in his life must at some point experience the pain and agony of the feet. And in Macho Man's case, he is feeling the pain of agony, pain, and divorce. Hmm, Flair, you bastard. Uh, Bastard, man. Savage kicks on a mic and he says he is going to kick Ric Flair's ass. And then, of course, Savage rushes to Flair and they both start beating each other up. But we go to commercial as uh, Ric Flair is starting to chop Macho Man. I can't believe she would do this to Macho Man. She slaps Macho Man in the face behind the rest of back. And this, of course, pisses Savage off. And he takes it out on Ric Flair. He brings him to that banquet VIP table. And he starts smashing Ric Flair's face in it with food on the table. He pours oh, the expensive that champagne. That is, yeah, that, that is not cheap. A little bit of the bubbly. He's just beating the tar out of Flair right now with different miscellaneous objects. 
Which is funny because there's a lot of Randy Savage matches where he either hits him with a chair or does this and the ref doesn't call for disqualification. Look, uh, they're also playing up Macho Man to be crazy right now, so I don't know if I would DQ him. Would you want to be? And you see what he's done to some That's refs. True. He just he has, slapped the ref through the other week. Yeah, he has punched the refs. That that would work for me if commentary had acknowledged that. Look, oh, maybe the refs not calling DQ because you know of, of Sam. Yeah, they're scared of him. Yeah, yeah that could work. And it would build in nicely to the storyline. That's right. Yeah. But eventually, Macho Man goes for a dive on the outside, but Ric Flair dodges, and then Ric Flair pulls something out of his knee pad and hits Savage with it. But after Ric Flair does that, that dirty tactic, he argues with the ref, and then Savage knees Flair in the back, which forces him to hit the ref, and the ref falls out of the ring. And then Savage low blows Flair and hits the flying elbow drop. And then he goes for another one, but Deborah, Woman, and Miss Elizabeth get in the ring and beg Macho Man not to do it, but he does it anyway, which is a common thing he's done recently. Uh, Benoit then runs out to interfere, and he immediately eats the power driver. <laughs> Arn Anderson then comes and gets thrown out the ring. So, I mean, Macho Man is making quick work of these boys. Mongo comes out, though, and he hits Savage in the back and then in the head with the Halliburton. And these are some loud shots, too. I like, I like it, though, today that they sold uh, getting hit with the Halliburton. Like, you're, you're done. Yeah, and then, of course, Ric Flair covers Macho Man for the win. So it's just another time where Macho Man has been screwed over in a match with Ric Flair. But after the match, the four horsemen stomp on Savage, and Mongo slaps him in the face. And then Flair continues punching Savage until eventually they all decide to leave, beating Macho Man down again and again. And then we have a backstage interview with the giant Taskmaster and Jimmy Hart. Hart says he told Sullivan that he couldn't trust anyone on the four horsemen. Taskmaster says that wars will be all over the place. He also says he has a strange mentality. And there's a fine line between pain and pleasure. Uh, you don't need to get into that, Sullivan. I don't need to hear about that. Don't need to hear about that from you. Thank you. Giant then says that if the horsemen are elite, how come none of them are the heavyweight champion? Giant says he is the best that ever came out of the Dungeon of Doom. And he says anybody in the Dungeon of Doom is better than anyone in the horsemen could be. False, 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 sir. A giant then challenges the horsemen to come after him. And then... Before the next match for Nitro, we have a ramp interview with Rey Mysterio. Mysterio says that he wasn't very happy that Malenko used the ropes yesterday. He says he respects Malenko, but he wants a rematch for the Cruiserweight title. And then he finishes the interview speaking in Spanish. So, of course, I don't know what he says. Which leads into the next match of Rey Mysterio versus Dean Malenko for the Cruiserweight title. At one point, Malenko hits a huge powerbomb on Mysterio. It's yeah, a thing of beauty. He lays it in. I did like that powerbomb. Also, there was a very nice scoop slam from Dean Malenko. Of course, you would make note. And then there is a spot. They kind of trade the uh, holes, and Dean Malenko monkey flips Ray, and then Ray just, you know, he flips back and stands up, so it's really crisp. Yep. Uh, it's another good match, but I'll get to the finish. Malenko hits what is going to be known as a scorpion death drop, but in this match, they call it the an inverted bulldog. But he hits that for the win. I liked this match better than the one uh, Bash the Beach. Yeah, I think so too. It wasn't as long, I believe. So no, I think that helped. Not a match for sure. That probably helped it too. Yeah, not as much in rest hole trading. But let's go back to Raw. We see Aldo Montoya and Jerry the King Lawler goes to interview him. And he tells Aldo that he reminds him of the warrior since he covers up his face. King then says that everyone is asking him, what is he going to do to the warrior? Then he hits Montoya with the microphone and then proceeds to beat Montoya up. So that's what he's going to do to the warrior, which is unfortunate because he was supposed to have a match with Triple H tonight. But King isn't done. He keeps beating up Aldo Montoya. He punches him and then he power drives Montoya and he tells the camera that that will be the warrior. Uh, Jake the Snake then comes out, and then King gets out of Dodge because King's afraid of snakes, and he goes back to the announce table. <laughs> but he gives Jake the Snake a look, and he just is like so angry. Yeah, pretty funny. But then also we get some footage of the Brian Pillman press conference. Pillman says the events of the past eight weeks have changed the future of his life. He's mentioning, of course, the car accident. And then he said he went from a point of not knowing if he was going to live to signing a contract with the WDF, and he thanks everyone for being there. I like that. To me, it's like Pillman was playing nice to get the contract, but then immediately after he got the contract, so he goes to loose cannon mode. Yeah, yeah, things would change very soon. Uh, but let's now go to the main events, and I'll start with Ross because it is the weaker main event. It is Goldust versus Jake the Snake Roberts. 
it should be noted that Harvey Whippleman is the ref for this match because remember a while ago Harvey Whippleman was coming out taking notes on the ref. You know that eventually led to Harvey Whippleman becoming a ref, and this sort of plays into the match. Goldust does some stalling tactics. He goes in in the ring, and then he goes back out. So the ref starts his count, but Harvey Whippleman kind of increases the count each time Goldust does this, and Goldust complains to Harvey Whippleman about this. He said that's not fair. I, I did kind of get a kick out of that because he was like speeding up his count. I'm like, hey, what is this Joker doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whippleman's not going to take Goldust's antics. And then during the match, Kings on commentary, of course, he talks about him self being tired of hearing about Jake the Snake's drug issues. And he says, this isn't the 700 Club, it's Raw. Most of the match is like Goldust playing mind games with Jake the Snake. Yeah. But also on commentary during this match, King spores the whole plot of Mission Impossible, which again just came out know, at right? this point. He, he legit gave the whole movie away. No, it's, I, 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 I was like, that was crazy, dude. I bet people were pissed. And then after he's done ruining the plot of Mission Impossible, he then tells Vince that he can give him the results of this match if he wants, which I think was such an interesting call to WCW doing that. Mm-hmm. Jake the Snake clotheslines Goldust, but Marlena is seen putting gold glitter in Goldust's hands. And then as Jake the Snake approaches him, Goldust throws it in Jake the Snake's face and punches him in the face and then pins him for the win. But then Harvey Whippleman, being the smart ref that he is he sees the glitter on the floor and he reverses the decision so he awards the win to jake the snake by disqualification and then goldust goes to attack jake after getting him up but jake the snake hits goldust with the ddt to the applause of the crowd yeah this was a very weak go home show honestly uh yes because next we have king of the ring coming up so for this to be the lead in is kind of weak but yeah, or, this... or, or have the Shawn Michaels pull apart brawl be the ending. True, that actually would have been better. But yeah, so this is a really weak episode. We do end with an aftermatch promo with Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette says he came up with the perfect choice to be the ref, and he shakes Mr. Perfect's hand. And Mr. Perfect tells us that he will be the perfect referee at King of the Ring, and he will call it right down the middle. Do you believe him? Yeah, why would Mr. Perfect lie? He's upstanding citizen. Just making sure. But let's go ahead and go to the main event of Nitro, which is Scott Steiner versus the Giant with Jimmy Hart. And this is a WCW title match. But Scott Steiner has some taped ribs, so he's selling the attack from Harlem Heat earlier in the night, which is good. I like we have consistency here. So during the match, Scott Steiner goes to pick up the Giant, and he almost gives him one time, but of course the ribs fail him. So he falls backwards and the Giant lands on him. So we're just kind of doing a whole lot of spots where the giant, uh, Scott Steiner tries to get the Giant up but can't because he's too injured and the Giant's too big. Steiner hits a fantastic government suplex on, on the Giant and the crowd goes nuts when he hit that. Scott's going to try to get him up. He got and he, and he suplexed a giant and he made it look easy. It looked easy. I, I bet he did most of the lifting because it's just phenomenal. Definitely the highlight of the match. Best moment. Yeah, because soon after that he gets a, yeah, it's like, like a wooden chair. And Jimmy Hart goes to grab it, but he, you know Steiner, you know, having the strength of a thousand men, he pushes Hart out the way and smashes over the giant and giant no-sells it. I love this finish because Scott Steiner sells it as she's shocked that the, it did no damage to the giant. And because he shows shock... That allows the Giant to get him up for the choke slam, and it is a phenomenal choke slam, and that's for the win. So, really great ending. Yep, yeah. It's like Steiner looks like he gave him his best shot and yeah. did nothing. He had his best shot, even with the chair, and he sold the surprise that it didn't, had no effect. I, I thought it was great storytelling. So, yeah, I like this match. I think I like this match better than the Luger one from the previous night. I would agree. So yeah, good, good main event here, and again, clean win for the Giant, building him to be this unstoppable monster. I can see what they want to. A giant at this time is phenomenal the crowd physique. Goes nuts for any choke slam, and it's just the big sh- the, no, sorry, the giant's huge hand grabbing Scott Steiner, who's a thick man, and his hand's still looking huge around his neck. That you know, the crowd got hyped. So good stuff here. After a commercial, we go to Mean Gene, and Gene says the six names that are being debated for Team WCW are Hulk Hogan, Sting, Macho Man, Ric Flair, the Giant, and Lex Luger. And the three names that were drawn were Lex Luger, Macho Man, and Sting. And they will be representing Team WCW versus the Outsiders and a mystery partner. But as far as the show, I mean, I think anyone can plainly see WCW wins this one. Not even close. Now, I mean, again, Nitro is two hours, so they have more chances. But sometimes, as you can just tell, even if it was an hour show, Nitro would have won. 
Yeah, Nitro won easily, and the ratings for this would be Nitro won 3.4 point three. So they agree with us by over you know a whole point. That's a big disparity. Um, actually, I believe this is the start of the streak. Oh, uh, week one of the 83 week streak. WCW has got a lot more going on right now. I mean, the only thing going on in Raw right now recently is the Bulldog Shawn Michaels feud and the King of the Ring tournament. Yeah, it gets better later. Late '96, there's a lot of stuff you can you can sink your teeth into. We do pick up a little bit at the King of the Ring, but there's still some there's still some rough episodes. Uh, but yeah, WCW just got more more info right now. Even the mid card of WCW is better. Like they're just doing more stories yeah, there. Just, yeah. 